It's my great pleasure to introduce Courtney Knight. Courtney is one of the leaders in Global Minded's Executive Leadership Council. And along with Dr. Lons Thompson and Ken Epps and several of our other leaders in Atlanta who said, we have to have a Global Minded event in Atlanta. And I know a lot of people say they can't say no to me, but you cannot say no to these folks when they say something like that. You just galvanize the resources and go, let's figure out how to make it happen. So let's give a big round of applause to Courtney Knight. I can't believe this is you in person. I can't either. We've only had a Zoom relationship. So this is quite a treat. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to Atlanta. Uh, I'm Courtney Knight. I'm the treasurer of the city of Atlanta. And for those of you are, who've traveled here for this purpose, we welcome you. Uh, for those of you who are from Atlanta, you already know we're the hottest city in the United States right now. About a month ago, Money Magazine named us the number one city in the United States for livability, for economic development purposes. The city's finances have come through the pandemic stronger than any other city in the United States. Uh, we just closed a $400 million bond issue yesterday, uh, providing for streets, bike paths, walking trails, parks, uh, community centers, public safety, fire stations, police stations. The bonds were, were received well in New York uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we received double A plus credit ratings just below triple A. So we are indeed here to serve. Um, when I met Carol a couple of years ago, I was immediately enamored with the mission of Global Minded. Um, I grew up in a single parent household in Phoenix, Arizona. Our family understood the value of education. Great grandma used to say, that's one thing that they cannot take from you. My mom worked hard, bless her soul. Sometimes we moved two, three times during the school year while she was trying to stay close to her job. But I had a guardian angel tap me on the shoulder uh, senior year in high school. And I was blessed to go to Harvard College, graduated from there with honors, uh, and then uh, attended Stanford Graduate School of Business to get my MBA. So I understood what it meant to overcome the challenges that many of these first gen to college kids experience. I understood that it only takes that angel tapping you on the shoulder to create an opportunity to change your life, to change your family's trajectory forever. Uh, and what, once I learned what the mission of Global Minded was, I was all in. I've been dedicated to expanding the work of Global Minded, finding them strategic partners, uh, opening up the doors to that organization across the country in every way that I could. Uh, so I'm here to greet you all this, this afternoon. Uh, hope that your day goes well. I look forward to meeting as many of you as I possibly can. I definitely wanna talk to the students that are here and let them know what it can mean to have that opportunity to change the future of your family forever. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the dais. Uh, so, so wonderful to see my friends here. Uh, my wife is a Georgia Tech alum. Uh, her girlfriends are in the house. And uh, we see you, Georgia Tech. And uh, thank you all for coming to Atlanta. OK, she next? OK, all right. Absolutely. Uh, and so one of my wife's best girlfriends, uh, it's amazing to me. I went to Harvard and then we dispersed all across the world, the country. So I have my friends, uh, my homies across the United States, but we're on a Slack channel. We're on Zoom. We have a monthly Zoom call, uh, but we're dispersed all over the place. It's amazing to me that my wife and her girlfriends came into Georgia Tech as freshmen 
some of them roommates, and here we are 30 years later, and they're all still just the best friends right here in Atlanta. They go to dinner together. They celebrate one another's birthdays. So I met Dr. Sabrina Atwaters uh, when I was actually dating my wife and um, have become close friends with her. Uh, I honor the work that she does here at the university with minority students. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend and my wife's best friend, Dr. Sabrina Atwaters. Well, good afternoon. This is a wonderful room to be in. And thank you so much to Global Minded and Carol and Celeste and the entire executive leadership team, including Courtney, um, for connecting us and giving us the opportunity. Um, we feel collaboration kind of amplifies the work we're able to do. And it started out as a small partnership about space. It evolved about a partnership about the work. And then here we are and partnering in this wonderful event. I know you've had an amazing time so far up until this moment. And I'm not biased because I'm the one going to lead this conversation. I'll start by that. I am trained to be very objective. Right. Everybody pause, right? We know who's in the room as an engineer. Um, but I will say most of my work in my training and my degrees has centered on technology who I started a love affair with early on. I'm a native of Atlanta, born and raised here in Atlanta. I grew up in zone six. I say zone six and I still use the precinct police precinct indicator to identify where I'm raised because that's how the introduction into the systems of America, education, career, and industry otherwise. And so being from zone six of the city of Atlanta, the non-gentrified one has a substantial meaning. I'm proud of that because I went to school with people you probably saw on TV in the PBS episode of Little Vietnam. Um, and I went there through high school and middle school and ultimately at Georgia Tech, my undergrad was in electrical engineering. Um, and then I worked for about 10 years in wireless from Sprint to AT&T. But then I, you know, took an interesting shift. I also have a master's um, in Georgia State and people like, so how does this work? You have five degrees and four disciplines and what do you do? So I'm gonna tell it to you all in the short version. Here it goes. When you're a first gen college student, you're the youngest of a family. When your parents who didn't finish high school are some of the most brilliant, intelligent, and impactful people you know, you start looking at systems early, but you start imagining. And so technology became a way to imagine change. And most of the world didn't realize how impactful, influential technology can shift us until the pandemic hit. And so I'm going to share my journey and then I'll share how I got here. So as a double E, double e in wireless internet technology, but I was there from the analog to the digital era where we transform life a little bit of the way we know it because now everything is digital, right? And then we moved on and I worked for 10 years of that, went back and got my um, master's in instructional technology that looks like education and technology because, you know, in 2005, we were still just thinking about how technology impacts education. And then just three years ago, most of our educational systems came on, moved the entire system to technological platforms. I went on and I have a master's in theological education and people are like, hold on, how does that work with technology? Where well, I studied religion and technology because our value systems and identity formation oftentimes are informed by the value systems and sometimes many are religious in our policies and structures. And so when technology blend with that, we're seeing a different stance of how that can influence even those very stable social systems. And then I came back to Georgia Tech because there's no way you can do design, production, and education and not think about people. So I came back and got my uh, master's and PhD in the sociology of technology and science, um, looking at how technology then influence people and platforms. I add all that, not so much to talk about me, but to say this panel, when we say the future of work is inclusive, 
it is diverse, it is just, and it is equitable. We didn't say if. That means we've already made the resolve. That is the future of work. What this wonderful panel is gonna help us talk about, think through and guide about is that the if is if you wanna be a part of it, then how? Do you make sure your organization, educational, industry, business, nonprofit, policy, wherever you stand, is going to be diverse, inclusive, just and equitable, or it just may not be at all? So are we ready to have the conversation? All right. So without delay, please help me welcome to the stage this wonderful panel across sectors of work. We have Dr. Loretta Aguirre, Vice Provost of Miami-Dade, James Reed, CEO and founder of Red Helicopter, Petal Walker, Managing Director of Deloitte and Touche, and my friend Guy Promise, who is the CEO of Community, Valence Community. Thank you all for joining us. That was the longest applause in the history of conferences. <laughs> And you came up last, so you know, it was really probably was all for you, Guy, I think. I right. right. <laughs> so I'm gonna join you all down here. I don't need this mic. So you all represent a, a spectrum of work and work sectors. Um, by way of introduction, tell us a little bit about who you are your journey to your current role, and how do you lead inclusively to overcome barriers you experienced? Who do you want to start with? I'm going to start with you. Okay, thank you. It's good to see you. Um, I would say that my journey to my current, and I, I apologize, I found out during the pandemic when my kids were home that I talked very loud, so you know, I, I'm gonna apologize for that. Uh, but, but I would say that my journey to being CEO of Valence, which is our mission is to create new paths to success for black professionals. Very, very simple. Um, and I would say that, you know, I, I spent many, many years doing technology, doing media. I ran Will Smith's production company. Um, Kobe Bryant and Steven Spielberg were investors in my virtual reality company. I ran go to market for MSN Entertainment before video was a thing. Uh, you know, I've done a lot in, in media and entertainment. Um, and, and my last venture, um, our investor was uh, Hubei, Prophet, Hubei Province, right, where um, maybe the, the coronavirus started, right? And so, uh, you know, we were doing virtual reality and Dave and & Buster's, and Dave and & Buster's shut down. Um, and, and, and so I had, uh, was at a crossroads. I was having some uh, conflicts with my, uh, my co-founder. I was having some conflicts, and uh, I decided, well, you know what, I'm going to look for something else. And, you know, I was looking around and, you know, trying to find the next best thing, you know, making my next move my best move, and, and really kind of uh, happened upon uh, the news on Memorial Day, right? And Christian Cooper and this Central Park birder thing was a, is an issue. And it just so happened that my friend had been trying to talk me into running Valence for a couple of years. And at that moment, it was very, very clear to me what I needed to do. I needed to put my pop culture acumen to work to actually build a Peloton for professional fitness, right? It's like, how do we get to the top? And how do we you know, kind of use Ray Dalio's principles to actually build an algorithm for us black people who weren't born with silver spoons, who weren't born with the rich uh, uncles, who weren't born with, born with the trust funds, the private school educations, how do we get to the top? And so that's really um, kind of how I came here. And, and I would say that, you know, working in OMED was my first job out of school. And I actually saw the power of what we're doing, right? You know, kind of that valence and saying, exposing people, setting high expectations and then giving them a system to succeed. And so I've been well-versed in this for Gordon Moore, remind me, he's, we've been at this for 30 years. I mean, he's about to retire, I think. I don't know, you know, it's like he's uh, been doing it for so long, but that's, um, this is just something that's natural to me. And, and I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my journey started, um, I was actually born in Guyana in South America, uh, you know, in a poor rural area. I came to America when I was six to a poor urban area in Queens and Jamaica, Queens. And that was quite the change. It's one thing to be poor in a rural area where you're not quite clear that you are poor, but in an urban area, you definitely felt it. And, and just growing up there in Jamaica, Queens, um, 
you know, like for instance, my, 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 my path from my house, my apartment building to my school, I passed, it was like a 70s movie. You pass the prostitutes, you pass the drug addicts, the heroin addicts going up and down and falling and standing up again. You pass the, the whole nine, they had a broth along the way. And so there were so many headwinds against me as I was coming up. I actually remember going with my mom, who was a single mom, to, um, to get her TV fixed and she couldn't afford it. And the guy just casually said that, you know, in exchange for a few hours with me, he, he fixed her TV. That was the world in which, you know, I was in. But God gave me two very powerful weapons, my mother and a fourth grade teacher. And it changed everything. My mother was an immigrant and she didn't understand the intricacies of the education system here, but she knew how to kick up dust and to raise her voice. And for instance, uh, it was a uh, fourth grade. I was in fourth grade, they split the class between just third grade to 4A and 4B. They put me in 4B. My mother went to the school. Why is she in 4B? She is able to be in 4A. What is, you know, how did this happen? They said, well, ma'am, little immigrant lady, oh, it doesn't really matter if it's A or B. It's all the same. We just split it for non-skills reasons. She said, okay, put her in 4A. So they put me in 4A because my mom insisted on that. There was no official difference, but weapon number two, I met my teacher, Miss Pettishon, German lady. Not cute, not cuddly, but she knew how to teach. And she made that math material so accessible. And the way in which she taught worked with my brain. I liked the discipline and the order. And from Miss Pettishon and my mother, those are the building blocks to Harvard, to Yale, to MD, to lawyer, to all of that really started with someone who believed in me and was willing to fight for me and someone who was able to give me the skills without any sweetness or light or I, none of that. But she delivered. She did her job well. And those two weapons allowed me to overcome. I like that. So I'm going to adjust what I was about to say. So my mother, who was very important to me, who I lost, uh, didn't kick up dust, which I think is one of the most defining things about my path, my life, and it'll make sense in a minute. So generally my path has been a bit of a hot mess. So for you younger people, it's very nonlinear. It seems like it's all over the place, but uh, it's always kind of made sense to me, um, which I think is the most important thing to sort of hold on to. It made sense to me. So I spent most of my uh, first kid to go to, um, first get born here to my immigrant parents. So a uh, different sort of story in that way. Uh, went to Harvard, went to Harvard Law School, studied people. So the Brits would call it politics, philosophy, economics. That's basically what I studied, right? How do people work? How do systems work, orgs work? Why? Like, why do people act this way? And uh, I taught high school after college. Uh, I've always sort of broken a system, figured out, and then I take time off to teach it to someone else, hold the door open and let it through. So I went to law school not to practice law. I actually thought I was gonna be a public defender. So if you think about my mother, so, um, and then my life took a weird turn. We didn't grow up with a whole lot of money and I ended up in some of the tallest buildings in Boston and New York managing billions of dollars of money. I've been a general partner at a big growth private equity fund. I've run a distressed fund and I set up my own uh, family office platform before there was impact investing. There was no word for it, but that's what I was doing. I was saying, I don't love what I learned about money. It doesn't reconcile with my caregiver parents. I'm a high school teacher. I'm a public defender. Why does it feel so bad? It just felt bad. And so I became like a forced entrepreneur in some ways. I said, I'm just gonna do this my way. So I'm gonna make money but it's gonna create a lot of positive externalities. And so I think why I'm here is that my life took a real left turn, but I'm gonna say it's a right turn in my 40s. I ended up running uh, one of the country's largest businesses serving and employing black women. Um, I know it may not seem obvious, um, but it was at a point in my life that um, it was a metaphor for me. Like this was, you can imagine being a woman, plus size, black, moderate income. It's a lot of things that are not easy systemically. There are a lot of things that are working 
against this person quietly. Many things, tax system, economic system, banking system, legal system, you can just keep. And the whole capital market system and the system that I became part of spit it out, right? Just said, and so no one was gonna come help this company and I, <laughs> I did. <laughs> And so it was supposed to be just six months and ended up being over seven years. I spent my entire forties basically running this company with these ladies and it's getting a lot of attention now because I think after the last two years, people understand, and I'm going to stop. We didn't just do things a little different. We recreated an entire world. I built the world from all these systems from scratch. And so I think right now my job is to sort of teach the world a bit and say, I won't let you tell me it's not possible because we did it. And so that's where I am right now. Great panelists, right? <laughs> so my story is somewhat similar, um, but I would say my tagline is that opportunity changes everything. So I think about my life and how my journey, it's really about saying yes. So my family is relatively middle income, you know, uh, at that time, it was it looked like middle income, but when I reflect back, it was close to poor, but it, <laughs> we felt good being where we were. Um, but during the summers, my dad would ask, what do you want to do? And I'd say, I want to work. So we, he would help me at his company, get a job, and I would work there. And one thing that I recall back that is the running thread in my life is that when others were playing, I would sit beside the computer guy and say, what are you doing? I don't understand it. So I would ask him a lot of questions. And before email became hot, I knew how to use the email system because of this gentleman. I would ask him questions and he would show me how to use it. So I learned Lotus 1, 2, 3, if anybody knows what that is, <laughs> um, how to manage the assets for the oil company. He would show me environmental pollution and it was just intriguing. And that's how I really got into the sciences. I had wanted to become a doctor, but with all of those experiences, I worked in a hospital, you no blood for me. So that was the end of that path. Uh, I went into environmental sciences and had a master's in environmental sciences. But one of the things that I realized as I went through that path is that maybe the, the education was giving me a tagline, environmental sciences was all nice and sexy, but the reality is that I wanted to impact people. I wanted to make a difference in my field. So when we moved to the US, my, uh, a relative said to me, you know that there are no black women in higher education. I was like, what? She's like, yes, that's where you're going to get a job and make a difference. So I applied to um, a, a non, <laughs> nondescript role called boat handler. Um, and my husband was like, what? I'm like, yeah, it, it, they said they take students on field trips and they teach environmental sciences. So I thought that was going to be really interesting because I could do what I wanted to do was to make a difference. And that was my first role in higher education. After that, taking students on field trips, engaging the youth in our community, high schoolers, um, employers, what I didn't know that through that journey from the part-time uh, boat handler to the field trip person to the, the instructor for environmental sciences, then I did a whole bunch of other roles at the institution. What I was doing was learning about helping people get a job. So my current role is in workforce as a, as a vice provost for workforce development, but all my experiences working with technology, right, from the early ages uh, when it wasn't a thing, uh, working with employers, helping them come and teach their uh, employees either about environmental sciences or uh, USDA, because we had a USDA grant, or any one of those things, I realized that we were preparing people to get a job. So I, I have made that my role. And one of the things that we've been doing lately is we're working with organizations like PepsiCo, uh, Bank of America, and, and many, many others, uh, Verizon, Comcast, many others, to look at how can we make a difference in our community as a two-year college or state uh, college, how can we make a difference for the people in our community that they can go back and make a difference in the world. So 
that has been my journey um, and that's sort of my purpose at this moment and, I, and I'm looking forward to talking more. Thank you all for that. Um, I think I learned a lot. You know, we're gathered here today and we're hearing from so many leaders, right? Um, but the title resolve to solve means we really want to get to the action, right? We want to get into what can be done, right? We're hearing these amazing stories from students and everyone else about the journey, right? And you all have shared your various journeys. You moving from media into, well, from student leadership into media, into, I love that line, the Peloton of professional um, fitness. You realizing their secret weapons in spaces that determine trajectory, right? And how that overcome barriers. You're realizing that create, sometimes space has to be created, right? And doing it your own way. And you're recognizing that even opportunity wise seen by chance can move in a very specific trajectory to build skill. But if you had to share with those of us that are here, how, right? What's the action? How can the future of work be diverse? be inclusive, be just, and equitable. What would I will, you say? I would say that um, embracing the golden rule, right? And the golden rule for me, you know, I, I went to, so uh, Professor, or I guess President now Thomas from Morehouse was my advisor at business school up at Harvard. And, you know, kind of understanding that he, she, or they who have the gold make the rules. And so really understanding that in order to do that, we need to be in, in positions of authority and leadership. So Ken Epps, who invited me to this conference and I met at a, a black corporate board readiness program. And I think that what I th we need to do is actually put more people purposefully in those roles. When I was growing up, there was a song called 19, right? And, and the song was about the average age of a combat veteran in Vietnam was 19 years old. Imagine that, right? I have a 15 year old son. Imagine the average age of a combat veteran being 19. 19 is also the number since 1955, when the Fortune 500 started, 19 black CEOs. In the history of going, I mean, if, if, if the Fortune 500 were a person, it would be ready to retire. 19. Five right now, right? So we need to work purposefully to get people into those roles. I make it, and it's probably not a popular notion here in Atlanta, but I make a, pur a purposeful trip to shop and support Marvin Ellison. I won't say what company he works for, but you know, it's a competitor to a major company here in Atlanta. I, you know, I, I shop at Walgreens because Ross Brewer and I worked at Starbucks together and I, I shop with her. And I, I think it's really, it, we have to be intentional about getting black board members, board members of color, uh, women board members, uh, disabled board members, my son and daughter have ADHD, you know, neurodiverse board members. We need to get all those people in because that's the only way when, when you're in that position of power that it's going to change. Thank you for that. Dr. So, Rivera? So I would say for a young person is you need to say yes. Um, have you seen that movie where they said uh, say yes every day for everything, right? Uh, it's really powerful when you say yes, because what happens is it opens other doors. So for example, Carol said to me, why don't you come be a part of this uh, panel uh, in June? And I said, yes. And here I am a couple of weeks, um, months later saying yes again. And this time I came with some students. So we're very happy that they said yes too. But why I say yes is that you open doors and bring people with you, right? If you don't say yes, you say no, you, without knowing it, you've inadvertently closed the door for that whole group that's associated with you. So think about the people you've come in with today, you've met new people, you said yes to that smile that looked at you a little unsure whether they should say hello or, so, or not, right? And that opened a conversation. You're like, wow, mentally, I didn't know that this could happen. But saying yes, I think is very powerful um, because it connects you to other people and it opens doors for all the people around you. Um, with, there was a time where uh, someone said to me, oh, I'm so glad to see you, a black female, you're doing this. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I just said yes to be there. I didn't really think about the impact of my presence in that space, right? So my, my thought is just say yes. Sometimes it, makes a, it goes a long way. I can go ahead. Um, 
I think in order to answer that question about how to make sure the future of work is diverse, inclusive, just, equitable, I think one thing we definitely need to do at whatever level we're at is to be very careful and focused on dominant narratives that are controlling behavior in subtle ways. And I can speak as an African-American. Um, you know, we, we often have to kind of step back and, and, and think about what it means to say African-Americans were historically slaves versus what it means to say they were enslaved. If I took a stockbroker off of Wall Street, threw him into a van, took him to another country, and forced him through brutality and imprisonment to work the rice fields, it would be wrong to call that man a slave. He was enslaved, right? And if someone asks me, why are you doing this? And I say, well, you know, well, you know, he's stupid and he's, he's ignorant and, he's, and he had, he's immoral. And so that justifies my taking him off of Wall Street and putting him here to work in these rice fields. That's the narrative that I create in order to justify my injustice. But that has nothing to do with him. He's not a slave, he's an enslaved person who was a stockbroker, a father, a husband, but now he's in this, he's in this position because of me. Right now, this is all history here for slavery here in America. It's past and gone, they're all dead. But the narratives survive. And I find that today, as we operate as African Americans, as African Americans, particularly for me, in this system, I'm constantly aware of the narrative and making sure that I don't buy into it and don't allow those around me to buy into it. Whenever I come into a leadership position as a black woman, there's always this period of settling, I call it, where everyone has to settle down and get comfortable because there is this sense of, what are you doing here? Who are you? They don't say it out loud, but it comes out in the actions and the not doing and the et cetera. It's like, okay, there's a period of settling down. And so I think, you know, that, that's one example in terms of the African-American experience. But I think being conscious of narratives and how subtle they are and how they help to explain things. You see an African-American talking, you see a white person talking, you see another person talking, and you make assumptions about the quality of what will come out of their mouth. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are narratives that, that, that really are, are they, they, they're, they're the water that we're swimming in. So you can't even tell you're in it anymore because it's everywhere. So I think that's really important for leaders to be thoughtful about, why did I pick X for that job? What exactly were his credentials? Why did Y not make it to the list? What exactly was the issue? Is it really based in substance or is it based in assumptions that I have made? And the same for those who are younger. Think about the narratives as you come up and make sure that you don't allow people to put you into boxes because of things that have been, have been designed from years past. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna answer this question and build on um, what the other panelists have said. So maybe I'll just, I like three, so I'll just say sort of three things. So you know, number one, when I look at how to be more diverse, inclusive, just, and equitable, it's, I could use the words human, proximate, accountable, intentional, and go back to human again. I love the fact that, you're a th that you study theology. It makes complete sense to me. So what is the purpose of work? What's the purpose of living? Defining success, defining leadership. These are all words that we have to really be thoughtful about. Uh, we are running a race. I'm not so sure if the race that we're running is the race that is the, should be run, if that makes sense. So as much as there's a real need to change, sometimes the best thing in change is to change some, but to hover and really be deliberate about what you want to change. And so the second thing I would say in that vein, um, I'm the Johnson Tra Chair of Entrepreneurship at Howard. And so part of what I'm doing now is teaching what we did. And it's a system dynamics framework, uh, which was, I'm also on the faculty at MIT. It was invented at MIT. It's nonlinear, causal, non-causal. It's kind of maybe sometimes for crazy people. <laughs> like, it's just this it's soup it's like it's a little bit of legal it's a little bit of tax policy it's a little bit of accounting finance behavioral org history neuropsych 
how do they all relate? So when I'm teaching at Howard and a lot of other schools, a lot of times the students are saying, oh my gosh, that's what is happening. We just didn't know. So it's making tangible, very intangible, invisible behavior drivers that are priming you to act in certain ways. And we don't teach our kids this. It's not done in this framework. It still bewilders me that we don't teach students, middle school students, how your brain works. It's your fundamental, your first system. If you understood how your brain works, you can't be manipulated by the absurd predatory marketing that happens in every consumer product company in this country. So that's like the second module I teach at Howard. It's how does your brain work? And I'm gonna show you exactly what buttons are being pushed by every email that you're getting. And then the kids are like, oh, <laughs> now we see your face when we get the email because we won't respond now. And then we just pause. That's two. And I think the third thing is the measurement. So my, my, my um, wife stayed home for 10 years. My mother, um, you know, it was not easy for our family. Like my dad had to go out. And my mom was a bit, sometimes a bit of a glass menagerie. She got, she had to make sure we could find public schools. I mean, she had to figure out this country, right? In another language. Um, but according to our economist, that my wife's life, my, my mother's life had no worth for the 18, 20 years that she raised three children. That's how GDP is defined. We are defining everything on consumption. I'm pretty sure my mother's life had a lot of value. And so the way we measure, which is what my TED talk is about, I'll, I'll end here. Like we grow up, there's a lot of goodwill in this room. This is what my TED's about. It's about goodwill. Like it's all the relationships that you have every day, your whole life that you build up. It's human capital. But it's funny, right? And in, in the highest levels of finance, goodwill, it refers to something completely different. It's literally a plug between uh, the value of assets on the books versus what you buy. It's not measured. So think about this. It's, it's, it was a, a point of irony for me that the thing you value most about in your life has zero value in finance. So we are priming people to measure success or measure things in a certain way. And so of course people behave in a certain way. So those are the three things that I would suggest um, that we need to sort of fix, reform um, in teaching. And we have to invest in the hard parts longitudinally. It's hard. We have to invest in young people. It takes a long time for that to pay off. But we live in a, in a short-term society. No one wants to do it anymore. So what kind of society are we going to have in 30 years? I mean, we, we all know what the answer is. That's why I'm here. It's like I'm here for the, where are the young people? It's the young <laughs> Yeah, it might you. not even take 30 years. It might be 30 days. Maybe. Yeah. It's you. Like in the most important investment, I can't think of any other place to spend time is than with them, but we don't want to do that. And I don't understand it. You know, that is a great segue um, into where I wanted to end. You know, we talk about diversity and equity and justice and inclusion, but we often talk about it as a way of how to get it into these already formed static systems that weren't really designed with that type of variety in mind, right? We, they were designed for a particular pathway and, you know, double E systems, we, we talk about, you get out what you, what you designed the system for. You know, and then if I point to anybody and they questioned their numbers on diversity, equity, and inclusion, I say, look at the design. Because you're producing what you designed for. Like we were not gonna act surprised. And so all of you talked about all of us to get to our places. I started with my winding road, but listening to all of you, it was a winding road. And yet to your point, when we talk about young people, we wanna put them on this very static path in some kind of way say, oh, but be innovative and diverse and inclusive in it. So I'm gonna do two things with this panel. Carol, don't get, don't get me. I believe we have brilliance in this room in the form of students. And because they're not yet in the leader's role, many of them don't talk. And I know we got the students have their say in the panel, but though, even those were selected. We have many students in this room. So with the last five minutes, I'm gonna turn it over to them. And so if it's one or two students with a question, I'm gonna ask you, prepare your thoughts. You can direct it to anybody up here. Um, 
Pick one, though, because we won't have a whole lot of time for all of us to respond. And if you want to come to the side of the stage and be ready. So that's one. I want to give your voice space and presence in this room. The second is my last question then. Um, and I'm not going to ask the one I know I already pitched to y'all in the paper. So sorry about that. <laughs> but I, I need to ask a more, a more candid question, I believe. Right? Hmm. The initial question for those in the audience was, what do you resolve to solve to make the future work? And I want to pivot. I want to ask, what are you going to hold your colleagues, your friends, your network, your peers accountable to, to make sure the future of work is diverse, equitable, and inclusive? I will say reaching back. And I used to have this, uh, when I worked at OMED, had a picture on my wall. You guys have all seen it. You know, it's uh, he ain't heavy, right? You know, it's uh, the hand reaching back. And I think that if we don't, and, and I, it was interesting that I'm here, I can't remember who the panelist was earlier, but said, you know, like they were grooming someone for leadership role. And, you know, this person uh, said, you know what, I'm, I'm too tired, right? I don't think that's acceptable. I, I, I really don't. And, and again, not, not, that, um, not that you're not tired, but we're all standing on the shoulder of giant, shoulders of giants, right? So I think holding yourself accountable for reaching back and then investing forward, right? You know, so my, my company was acquired by a company called Greenwood Bank, right? Greenwood is a black owned bank that serves the entirety of the nation. And it really is important. It doesn't have to be Greenwood, but invest your money, put your money to work with a black, with a brown, with an LGBTQ, you know, there's a company that invested in us called Gangels, right? They actually t spent some of their money and it's an LGBTQ fund. They invested in this black ecosystem. And, and I think that's really, really important that we invest in each other, right? Take 15%. You don't have to put your whole paycheck in, in the black bank. Take 15%. The, take the 15% pledge and put 15% of your earnings and your, your uh, take home in, into the, a black bank. Everyone can do that. Everyone can do that. Thank you. I think um, for me, working with the, my colleagues, but also with my clients, it's about helping them to understand that the, the location of the money has moved. Because the motivation, you have to think of people's motivation. The motivation for my, my clients and my colleagues, understandably so, is where is the money? And the future, the world has changed. The pandemic has changed the world. Immigration has changed the world. The world now is darker. The world now is younger. People you're selling to have changed. And so key to that message is being able to help them to understand that reality has moved. And if you want to find the money and you keep looking in the same direction, the money has been moving. Digital assets is also a focus of mine, understanding that the market has moved. And I find that that, that is a great motivator because you take the shiny object that people are chasing and you move it here, the eyes will follow the shiny object and then you can explain, here's how, you know, here's how we, we address this. Here's how we make you, we, we, we make your company work within the, the new reality. So that's the approach that I take. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so 10 years ago, part of why I ended up having to pivot my life that way when no one else came, I was, saying to people uh, as an investor i had two predictions it was i was long women as in every way um change agents entrepreneurs leaders long women long people of color and i used to call it brown a spectrum of brown and then when they met <laughs> women and brown i was super long and so part of this the first few years uh, building this world that we built, it was a little bit of deprogramming and asking, do you know what it feels like to be the majority? It took a while, right? To really, and then, ah, and I could see it in uh, my employee base, customer base. There was a, once that happened, it just, you know, it, and it was very inclusive the other way. Like we use tech. We imported like 40% of our econ business ended up being from white neighborhoods. 
And I earmarked all that money and I invested that money, the profits into black neighborhoods, into tech. We were reverse polar, the polarity of capital reversed. And, I, and it was on purpose and I tracked it. So it was very inclusive the other way. And so it was a real lesson where I also said, listen, um, money is green, right? So money is, that, that money is good too, because you do need, re, in reality, you need it to fund some things. So that, that's how I would think about things. It's a, it's, a, it's a mindset thing. It's very hard, but that's the prediction for the future. Certainly the country that I, I hope to see. Well said. For me, I would say authenticity. Because um, if I was going to hold other people accountable, I would want them to know that I'm authentic in my practice. Um, and I would also want to hold them to be authentic in their practice. Um, for example, simple things like you have a, a committee that you're putting together and you want that committee to be able to be the voice, whether it's a student committee, a, an advisory committee, Ensure that the committee is a diverse group of individuals. Sometimes that's hard. Uh, it seems easy when you're in a space to just say, oh, I'm gonna get this committee together, but you need to stop and look, does it represent male, female? Does it represent the different ethnic choices or groups in that community? What are you trying to have this community? Because whatever decision they make, they will, it will impact that group forever and ever or decision forever and ever. Right? So just being authentic in your practice and ensuring that you stop, look at the data. Does it really tell you what you're wanting to tell? Or you're trying to mix it up to make it say what you want it to say, right? Because that happens too. Uh, and we have to be very careful with data uh, because it can be used to say things that can either make the system the way the system is or make it look something different. So. We have to really be authentic in our practice, in simple things, simple everyday things, and in those big things that have long-term reach. That would be my... Thank you, excellent. So, did I have any students take... I have one, perfect. Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> We're gonna pick one though. We really are. I know, you know, I love it. And you got to the stage first, so it is you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adana McBride and I am a current sophomore majoring in economics um, with a business concentration at the illustrious North Carolina A&T. And my question is for you, Mr. Brahe. I don't wanna pronounce it wrong. Um, H is silent. Brahe, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as an economic student, I'm struggling currently trying to figure out what I want to do and what path I want to take. But as I said, and listen to you, um, in all sense, I basically want to do what you're doing and want to kind of follow that pathway. Um, so my question for you is, um, what was it that either clicked or the person or what was it that told you, like, this is the path you wanted to take? Like, this is what you ultimately wanted to do um, and live your life? I, I, it took me a while to realize that school only starts after you graduate. You, it never ends. So that's one thing my parents never really taught me that you're supposed to keep learning forever. And you know, as adults, you figure you know everything. And like, I really, I'm 52 in February. I feel like I'm 12. I'm in a mode of like, just, I feel really creative, really young. And I'm like, I'm not supposed to know everything. Whoever thinks they're supposed to know everything in this world right now is, don't listen to them, right? And so I kept learning like all these things and I didn't view anything as a waste because it made sense to me. I was like, oh, this is how they connect. So like the causal stuff was more important. So you learn A, you learn B, you learn C, but what they don't teach as much is how does A relate to B, relate to C, and if you adjust C, what happens to A? So that's a system dynamics framework. That's number one. Number two, what really clicked and not to, you know, was, was my time during my forties. I, as much as I gave permission for these ladies to be themselves, they were very, they were very, they gave me permission to be me. 
it had been a long time that someone let me be that because let's face it, right? Harvard guy, guy, Asian guy, I'm pretty good with math and all this stuff, but I'm a suppressed like musician. Like I'm a creative guy. And I also, you know, like I, I love people. And so when I, in my forties, it was finding a group of people, which happened to be, you know, if you ask me to predict it in my thirties, who would it be? It was black women. And they said, we feel your heart from like five miles away. That's the most important thing. And it was such a, <sighs> that, right? I was like, you actually really understand me. And so I think that's the other advice I'd give you is to, as much as it's hard to find people and you can, it's really easy to be skeptical about people right now. I'm still really pro people. People will surprise you, right? So keep trying to be an optimist without being naive about things. Keep learning and surround yourself with people who know you're not supposed to know everything and they don't penalize you for it. I think that's what a great leader does, right? I think, I think teachers, are great leaders. I wish we had more of them in the private sector as CEOs. So I think great teachers make great CEOs. That, that, is that helpful? Yes, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So with that, we were going to close out this session and we'll close it with one word from each of our panelists that you want to leave with us today. That, that one word that sums up what you would want to leave um, for everyone that's in attendance today. I would just say elevate, raise your game. Reflect. Kindness. And I would say, I'm going to do a sentence. Opportunity is everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you so much, Guy, Petal, James, and Dr. Everett. Thank you.